I was recruited to develop uh, certain tests to uh, answer some of the questions that we have for developing new compounds in the oncology field. So uh, as outline of my presentation, I'm gonna talk about what is the biopharmaceutics risk management that we have as established workflow in Pfizer, inherent risks with weekly basic compounds and biopharm risk assessment and uh, two case studies uh, to talk about. The challenges with API form and it's some questions and challenges that we have every day for on project team settings is how to accelerate our projects. The timeline has been reduced from 10 to 11 years to only five years in some uh, programs that we have. And this is really a challenge because we need to meet three pillars in the industries about manufacturability, stability, and because it's oncology, it's all a route of administration. So we're talking about the biopharmaceutics. So the project teams need to nominate an API form. And what I mean by API form, is it a crystalline, is it amorphous, is it a free form, or it's a salt or a co-crystal? These are all the things that we think about when we have a hit or a target molecule. And what the risk of nominating a salt versus a free form? It is time issues, it's a cost issues. It's not we need the salt to enhance something. We have to calculate the risk with that. And because it's risk, we need to have an assessment tools. And what I'm talking about today is one of those tools that we use. And it's a smart turtle, not a fast turtle. So we're moving smart and fast at the same time. So if you look at the workflows that we have, and we call it end-to-end -end design, end-to-end, -end, our first end starting from the hit molecule that we have. And the second end would be the post-approval uh, and market launch. When I'm, talk when I'm talking about biopharmaceutics, the term could be new to you, but it is how we have interrelationship between the physical chemical properties of a drug, the dosage form or over a drug product, and the route of administration that would affect the rate and extent of oral absorption. So I'm focusing on oral absorption, the A in ADME, and we trying to focus on that because it's oncology. Oncology always, we're gonna give the uh, drug to our patients to take home. We don't have inpatients clinical trial, at least in phase 1P. So in our group, we focus on the first part here when we have the preclinical stage passed and going to phase 1, where we, IND is, is uh, close to, sub to be submitted. There are main two questions that we ask. What is limiting the exposure, either in animals or in humans? And how we can enable this exposure via formulation or change in API form? Can we give the drug with food or in fasted condition? What would be the risks if we give it with food versus fasted when we have a package insert? What would be the label for the compound when it's marketed? If the exposure is good, what would be the PK parameter that would drive the efficacy? Is it gonna be C-min or C-average? Can we have a sustained release formulation to maximize the exposure and turn efficacy? All these questions is part of the risk assessment that we do in the biopharmaceutics biopharma risk management workflow. When I'm talking about specific class of compounds, I'm just gonna talk about the, the physical properties of those compounds. For weekly basic compounds, uh, a standard protocol in Pfizer is to generate pH solubility. On the, right, on the left side here is an example of one of our compounds, and it, as you can see, it's a weak basic compound, so it has low solubility at the higher pH, and higher solubility at the lower pH, this is, has a parent pKa of 5.1. There is a difference between a parent pKa and true pKa based on the method that you uh, use to define the pKa. For this one, because we're using pH solubility profile, we call it a parent pKa. And as you can see, there are two points here on the curve that in different color because it doesn't fit henderson hassel bulk equation, and this, this, there is a reason for that. So these points are, are of interest for us. This is where we observe and do more experiments. I'm not gonna touch base on those because it's another lecture. But what we are trying to do 
by understanding the pH solubility profile is the concentration in solution in the lumen, in the intestinal lumen that would dictate the flux through the interior sites and then to the portal vein. And what we are looking for is the fraction absorbed or FAFG. If you don't have the PK course, go back and look at those terms, FAFG. And this is a term that we are interested in because this is more related to what we can change in terms of formulation, API form. We don't have much handle on the metabolism of the compound or the clearance mechanism of the compound, but what we can change is the formulation which can, could lead to changes in the flux of the drug through the interior sites. For a weak basic compound, we start by giving the drug in the stomach where it's acidic pH, the drug has luxury of high solubility. The drug goes into the solution and progressing to the intestine where we have higher pH. At this higher pH, the drug crashes out of solution and precipitates out. So the driving force for absorption is minimized because the drug is now out of solution. So how much impact this physiological or physiological condition would have on the physiochemical properties of the compound, how much impact we would have in reduction of the absorption. This is something that we need to test. Going back to what we know about BCS classification and devolvability BCS classification, as you know, we have four classes of compounds. Class two is poor solubility, high permeability compound, and it's subdivided to the solution rate limited and solubility rate limited absorption. And there's formulation fix for these two subclasses. For the solution rate limited, you can reduce a particle size by jet milling or attrition milling, or can form salts. So you have higher the solution. For solubility limited absorption, you can have the drug in amorphous form and instead of crystalline form, you can have lipid-based formulation to change the solubility and enhance absorption. So it depends on what you know about your compound. This is an example of what would happen for an API form in the form of a in the form of a salt. So what happened in the salt that it would have high fast dissolution rate, and when it goes fast dissolution rate, it go to a state where it's su supersaturating the solution beyond what we call critical supersaturation. And when it passes this point, it's unstable. It's thermodynamically unstable and tends to go to a, a more stable state. And this starts with a process called nucleation, where the molecules try to come together and form nucleus. And nucleus is unstable. It has to be stabilized by forming a larger molecule. So this happens through a crystal growth process. And then at this point, the concentration starts to decrease. Nobody can predict what happens. The nucleation process is a stochastic process. It cannot repeat itself even if you have the ultimate control on the experimental condition. But we can assess how risky this process is if we can do or can design the right test. So if we look at what we know or what we understand about the physiology and how we can imitate that. So if we go from a stomach to the intestine, this is a transfer. And this transfer can be done in in vitro. So you can have a beaker with HCl and move the contents of the beaker to another beaker with pH 6.8 and you have stomach and intestine. Is this simple? Yes, it's simple. Why don't we do it? I don't know. But somebody thought about it. In 1992, it was the first transfer model and they call it the artificial stomach duodenum model. And this was 1992, two physicians thought about what the effect of the histamine reducer agents on the solubility of freebase. And they developed the test and this is the original publication that they have. I'm not gonna go through these details. But they have another enhancement of the test in, in 1994. They added some enzyme to the beaker that represents the stomach and to look at the enzymatic degradation uh, at this point. In, in 2010, Lilly had done, had done some work in enhancing the model by adding more complex uh, steps to the model by adding pumps, transfer rates, other buffers, sync conditions, non-sync conditions, so complicated. It didn't stop at this point. 
There is another company called TNO, developed the most sophisticated transfer model in the history of the human being. And it's very expensive, and it's very lengthy to run the sets. It takes a week to run one experiment. And when we saw this, and Pfizer was interested, actually Pfizer bought this model, and to run this model, it takes a week to, to run this model. Is it fast enough for us? The smart turtle would be fast by doing that? I don't think so. So what we did is, I quoted here Albert Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And this is what I did with the biofarm group. This is, the this is the setup that we have. We have an infusion pump with a syringe that has the pH condition that represents the stomach. We infuse this contents to a beaker. This beaker has pH of 6.8, similar to the intestine. It has a pH probe to measure the pH and pion system to have inline life measurement of the concentration in this beaker. It's very easy, very simple. You can tweak it, you can make it more complex, but not simpler than that because this would give you the basic condition that you need to know about the supersaturation, the rate of precipitation, the rate of nucleation, and you can use this model to look at your compounds. I'm showing here one example of a model compound that I use called dipredamol. It's a weak basic compound, pKa of around 6.5. And what I'm, what I'm showing on the, right, uh, on the left side is a clinical trial to sample the intraluminal contents in human subjects and measure the concentration in the intestine. And when I ran the model I, and I stumbled on this paper, I said, okay, what would my model predict versus what they sampled in human uh, trial? And it was really amazing to see that we matched the rates of crystal growth that they showed, or we measure the concentration over time. So this means simple is not bad. Simple can be used in a smarter way to predict the concentration of the plasma in subjects if we put it in the PK model. And that's what we did. We use bottom-up approach to predict human plasma concentration from simple instruments building on the physicochemical properties of the compound. Now I'm gonna go to the case studies, how we use this to choose the API form. So in this example, we have a molecule of uh, Pfizer pipeline in oncology and it's low water solubility free base. And the, we thought about a salt to enhance the uh, dissolution and bioavailability of the compound. So it was transitioning to pivotal phase one, which means that the data from clinical study would be used for IND. It's a weak base with 3.5 pKa, intrinsic solubility 30 microgram per mL, solubility is high, and HCl around 60 microgram per mL. It's not impressive, but much better. Moderate permeability, and the projected dose is 250 meg uh, once a day. And the, the question is, in FIP or first in patient, we have what's called single dose escalation. So you, give, you start with a small dose based on your safety data and keep dosing up. Would this physical property support absorption at doses up to 1,000 meg? Of course not. What would be the solution? Is to change the form, have higher absorption based on higher dissolution. So what we did, some modeling, on this side to look at the fraction absorbed versus dose using gastroplus at two different pHs in the stomach, pH 1.3, pH 5.5. So we know that from this simulation that there, was, there will be no PPI effect. There could be food effect because we didn't look at the bile salt concentration. But what we did in the lab is taking this molecule and formulating a salt without synthesizing a salt. And it's very little, very small trick that we do in, in the setup. You have your free base, mix it with a solid salt in the, in the syringe and infuse it and see what would happen. And what would happen when we have amicylate, sulfate, oxalate, camp sulfonate salts, the supersaturation was much higher in the intestine than the free base, which gives you an indication if you take this into animal study, this would be the order of the AUC that you would see. This is for mesylate salt. 
This is for oxidate. This is fit condition. This is fasted condition. I'm listing in the middle what's called SDD or spray dry dispersion. It's amorphous form of the compound that we use constantly in the preclinical species to enhance exposure. So our test was able to predict what would be the AUC even without running any modeling or any simulation or expensive synthesis of the actual molecule. The second case is very famous case in Pfizer. It's about a compound called Ibrans. It's a breakthrough uh, breast cancer therapy, and it's a leading uh, Pfizer uh, portfolio compound. And what they found that when they give the drug to a fasted population or a fasting cohort, the AUC and CMAX, sorry, the CMAX was lower than when they gave the drug to a fed population or when they used ivithyanate salt of the compound. So we have two conditions here. Ivithyanate salt has higher exposure. The, the free base has to be given on a fed state condition. It is a torture for cancer patients to force them to eat before having their medication. This is not optimal. Who was talking about optimal? This is not one of those. So we have to change the medication. This has already went through IND. We cannot change the molecule, but we can change the formulation. So how we can do this, how we can change the formulation to enhance the exposure. So this is a part of the pattern that we uh, file. This is a table where we show that the uh, AUC in the fasted condition is much lower than the fed state at different, do at different calorie levels of the drug. The key experiment that we did is the same, syringe and beaker. But in this time, we have different concentration of the buffer. With the buffer, when you change the concentration, you change the solution kinetics. When you change solution kinetics, you change the supersaturation probability. What we notice that when we mix the powder with acetate buffer at this different concentration, we had solution versus suspension. So this gave, gave, gave us an indication that the concentration of the buffer species would make a difference in the supersaturation. If we attain supersaturation in, in vitro, we can repeat the, that with the right formulation in, in vivo. What we did next is we repeat the same test with different buffer of solid counter ions. Why solid? Because this is going to be oral dosage form. We cannot give IV. So we did screening of maliate, succinate buffer, tosylate buffer, and the one who stood up was succinate buffer. So if we take succinate powder, mix it with the drug in a tablet, what we would get? We would get different formulation or different ratios of the excipient that we can do. And because we can process this in, in different ways, we can have different formulations. So what I'm showing here is the solution test for succinic acid and the drug. The one that stood out here is the uh, uh, fluid bit dryer formulation. And it shows that it has much better dissolution profile. And when we did the sorry, when we did the cohort clinical trials, we can see that this is succinic acid tablet, this is spray dry dispersion, this is another tablet with SDD, this is bilayer, fluid bed dryer, oral solution. We can see that we have uh, a threshold here for the BE. If we if you cross this line, you're not BE. If you're above the, this line your BE or bioequivalent. So all the formulation that we have were bioequivalent to the salt that we, we were, this, this was our benchmark. So it worked and it was the uh, second generation for this formulation using a very simple technique. As a summary, transfer models help with bottom-up approach. Selection of counter, I know if API doesn't need medicinal chemist to uh, formulate the salt from the get-go. Also, it is not a rule that salts always enhance oral absorption. It's based on what you understand about the API or the counter ion and how you uh, administer the uh, drug.